All righty, everybody. I just got the okay to start our planetarium show. So for now, I'm going to put away our space trivia questions on screen because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. Ooh. And once again, welcome everybody to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I'm going to be your planetarium presenter for this afternoon. And uh, just to let you know, folks, everything that you're going to see in purple is going to be one enormous screen, thanks to the help of six different projectors hiding throughout our planetarium dome, which is going to give us that very immersive picture that we'll see in just a little bit. And just to let you know, folks, the show that we're going to be doing right now is different from all the other previous planetarium shows that we've done here in the dome today. This show is called Tour of the Universe. And essentially with Tour of the Universe, you're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. I want to be completely live uh, speaking and flying at the same time. But not only that, we're going to be starting off pretty close to Earth, and we're going to zoom all the way out to the very edge of the known universe. Hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we, in, we, are, we are in space, because uh, we are very, very tiny in the grand scheme of things, just to let you know. And before we get started with our planetarium show, I do got to go over some quick house rules, just so that we're all on the same page. We're going to have a great, uh, great time in the planetarium. First off, there is no food or drinks allowed inside. If you manage to bring any snacks or beverages, make sure those are put away to the very end of the show. We want to keep the theater nice and clean for all the guests coming in today. Uh, we also want to make sure that there's no feetsies on the seatsies, so remember to keep the feet on the floor and not in the seats. We want to keep the seats nice and clean for all the guests coming in in the future, so we appreciate that, y'all. And folks, if you ever have any 21st century gadgets like cell phones, smartwatches, tablets, anything that produces bright white light or loud sound, now is the perfect time to turn them off, deactivate them, put them away for the next 30 minutes, as these can be very distracting for the folks sitting behind you. We want to be courteous to everyone in the dome. And also, folks, please remember to wear your mask above your nose at all times while we're in the planetarium. We're going to be here for about 30 minutes. There's quite a few of us in here. So uh, thank you for that. We do appreciate your cooperation. And also, folks, if you do need to exit the planetarium uh, during the show, you're more than welcome to exit. All we ask is that you exit at the very top of the planetarium. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and after the show. So when in doubt, always make your way up the stairs, not down them. And last but not least, folks, this show is quite immersive thanks to our 70-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, there's a really quick and easy way to ground yourself. All you got to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, and your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not flying through space, at least not more than the usual. <laughs> but with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go with our tour of the universe. Let's get started, y'all. All righty, everybody. As I mentioned, we're going to be starting off pretty close to planet Earth, not exactly right at it. We can see the Earth just down below us, that nice uh, big blue sphere. But we're going to be starting up a little bit higher at this really cool contraption known as the International Space Station. Or we also like to refer to it as the ISS because that's a really long name. But what is the International Space Station? Well, for one, this is the biggest thing we humans have ever put into orbit around our planet Earth. And it looks really big on our planetarium screen right now, but it's not that big. It's only about the size of an American football field. Uh, if you've never been to an American football game, don't worry. You can also use the whole California Academy of Sciences, the building that we're in right now, from one garden all the way to the other. But what is the International Space Station? Well, this thing is a collaboration between many nations across planet Earth to pretty much figure out what happens to things in space. For example, uh, Different scientists want to conduct different experiments that they can't really conduct on Earth because it has gravity, because it's close to our planet. So they want to conduct experiments that have, uh, see what the effects of low gravity would do. So some of the experiments that they'll conduct up here, for example, is what happens when you try to grow plants in space? When plants grow on Earth, their roots grow towards gravity, towards the Earth. But what happens when you try to grow a plant really far away with less gravity? Do the roots grow up? Do they grow sideways? Which way do they go? And another thing that they've tried out is uh, what happens when you try to spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does it act differently with less gravity? So these are some of the different experiments that they'll conduct up here at the International Space Station that they can't do on Earth. And also, folks, uh, the International Space Station looks really far away from our planet, but it's not too far away. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of our Earth. 225 miles, that's not too far away. That's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get away with the family for the weekend. 
And one of my favorite things about the International Space Station is that this thing is going incredibly fast, folks. It's going to whop in 17,000 miles per hour, where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes, where it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. And also, just to let you know, folks, this is as far as we put humans into space nowadays, because traveling into space gets quite costly quite rapidly. First, you got to get your hand on a rocket ship or build yourself a rocket ship. And then you got to account for all the rocket fuel. And you need to get a lot, a lot of rocket fuel. And I mean a whole lot of it. Once you get your hands on all that rocket fuel, you also have to account for all the food, water, and all the air you're going to be breathing while you're up here in space. So the bill starts to get quite costly quite rapidly. But let's leave the International Space Station behind. Because now we're going to see it slowly fade away compared to our planet Earth. And before we lose sight of their International Space Station, I want to put a nice little trajectory line so we can keep track of it as we continue zooming out. And as we're zooming out and getting a much larger view of where we are on planet Earth, I do want to let you know, folks, that the space program that I'm using here in the planetarium is something that you can go home and download at at home and you can fly through the space just like how I am right now. The space program that I'm using here is something called Open Space Project. So if you go to your favorite uh, search engine, type in Open Space Project, uh, you'll be able to go to this website and download it. But just a heads up, folks, this program is not completely finished. It's in its beta phase, which means it's, again, not completely finished. So we may come across a few glitches and bugs here and there. In fact, I see a nice little bug right there. See, now there's some missing data right there, but that's okay. I'll point them out for you. And also, um, to let you know, open space uses a whole lot of information and processing power. So I wouldn't recommend downloading this program if you have an older computer. Uh, maybe if you have something newer in the past couple years, and, or maybe even a gaming computer, go for it. Try out open space. It's a whole lot of fun. But if you also want to fly through space without having to download anything, we also have another option for you, something called NASA's Eyes. Just like your human eyeballs, just type in NASA's eyes to your favorite search engine. Don't have to download anything, and you can fly through space easy peasy, which is a whole lot of fun. I love flying through space. But now that we got a good sense of where we are on Earth, let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. All righty, folks, so we are making our way over to the moon, and just to let you know, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was quite a while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. They got to conduct science, they got to walk around, and of course, they also had to have some fun, and they also got to play golf up here as well. But again, that was quite a while ago. Last time we sent humans was 1972, a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, NASA has a new space mission in the works that's going to be sending humans to the moon uh, in the next few years. This new space mission is called Artemis. So that's pretty funny to say because Artemis is a sister to Apollo in Greek mythology. NASA is really good at coming up with these space mission names. I love it. But what's the whole point of Artemis? Well, NASA wants to send humans... Uh, to Mars, but before we send humans deep into our solar system, we got to figure out exactly how we're going to live out here in space. So again, instead of sending humans all the way to Mars and say, hey, figure it out, we can use the moon, which is pretty close to us, as a nice stepping stone to figure out all the logistics, how we're going to live up here in space. Now, what's also really cool with Artemis is that they're also going to be sending the first uh, woman to the moon, but not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon, but not only that, they're also going to be setting up dinner, different lunar bases all across the moon. Pretty much uh, they'll conduct, set up scientific bases. Let's say they want to check out the Maria, these flat, low areas. They'll set up a base right over there. Maybe they want to check out this crater uh, right over here. They'll set up a base there. Or maybe they want to go check out the very high mountain ranges on the far side of the moon over here. They'll set up a base there. Now, what's also really cool is that they're going to also have a space station that's constantly orbiting around the moon at all times, kind of just like how we saw with the International Space Station. So if anything was to go wrong, these astronauts can launch off the surface of the moon and head back to that space station where they would be safe. Ooh, sounds pretty cool. But again, we humans should be heading back to the moon in the next few years, crossing my fingers. Hopefully everything goes according to plan. Uh, can't wait to be up here, hopefully one day. But sometimes, folks, when we look up here at the moon, um, especially here from Earth, 
Sometimes the moon feels so incredibly close that you can reach out your arms and touch it. Feels like it sometimes, especially when it's close to the horizon. But just to let you know, folks, the moon is incredibly far away from us. It's about 240,000 miles away from the Earth. Whew, that's really far. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. And if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine driving to the moon if you drove for four months nonstop going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. <laughs> and uh, from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities. So astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed. Now, light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it takes light only one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it is time for us to leave the moon behind. So everybody say bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And on our journey, folks, we're going to be stepping out into a much larger realm of our solar system because now we're going to watch the moon and the Earth as they slowly recede, as they slowly disappear. And before we lose track of the moon and the Earth, I want to put up all the planet trails so we can see where everything is out here in space because it's really hard to see stuff out here in space. And now, folks, on our journey, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination, thanks to help of computer models like Open Space, showing us the most accurate images and information available to us. Now, the nearest star to us, uh, the sun, comes into view. Do 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 do. There it is. And the, just to let you know, folks, the sun is incredibly far away from us as well. The sun's roughly about 93 million miles away from the Earth. Whew. 93 million miles away, that is nothing compared to the speed of light. Now, again, we are the third rock from the sun. So the sun's right in the middle. We got one, two, three, right up there at the top. That's where we were, uh, where we just were. So, again, for sunlight to travel all the way from Earth or from the sun to the Earth it takes about 93 million miles to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's only about eight and a half minutes at that speed of light. So, not too long. But this is a really cool concept to keep in mind because let's say if the sun was to turn off all of a sudden, there's no more sunlight being emitted. That last bit of sunlight would uh, leave the sun, travel that 93 million miles, take that eight and a half minutes to get to Earth. And that last bit of sunlight would reach us here on the daytime. And then all of a sudden, the daytime would become nighttime. Now, this is a really cool concept because this works for really far away objects as well. Let's say we're looking at a star that's 60 light years away from us. Well, we're looking at that star as it looked like 60 years ago because that light just got to us. We're seeing it, that light right now. So when we're looking at really far away objects in space, uh, it's kind of like looking back in time in a sense. Pretty cool. But now that we have a nice bird's eye perspective of our solar system, really quickly, I'm going to name all the stuff in our solar system. There's quite a bit of stuff in here. So right in the middle, we have our sun, Sol. And then the closest uh, planet to the sun, we have Mercury. Then we have Venus, Earth. And then Mars. These are all the rocky terrestrial planets. These are places we can land a spacecraft on. And then beyond the orbit of Mars, we have this really cool thing called the main asteroid belt. And this is what it would look like if we to highlight all the asteroids in our asteroid belt. There is quite a few of them. So give our program just a little bit of time to load those up. There they are. Now, what's really cool is that there was a the asteroid belt was discovered in the early 1800s by this organization in Europe called the Celestial Police. And in my opinion, the Celestial P Police kind of sounds like something out of Doctor Who. I love when scientists get really geeky with their names. It's so fun. Now, beyond the orbit of our main asteroid belt, we have the really big planets. We have our gas giants, our Jovians. We've got Jupiter, the biggest planet in our solar system. Then we have Saturn. And then beyond them, we have our really big icy gas giants. We have Uranus and Neptune. And of course, of course, we can always add everyone's favorite lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. And here's the orbit of Pluto coming on screen for you. There we go. There's Pluto. So it's just popping up just down below our screen right over there. There's the orbit of Pluto. And just to let you know, folks, Pluto hangs out in this outer part of our solar system past the orbit of Neptune in a region called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, the Kuiper Belt's going to be all this stuff. Whoa. So 
So again, this is all the Kuiper Belt, and pretty much the Kuiper Belt is the second asteroid belt way out here in the outer part of our solar system. What you're going to find out here are icy asteroids and icy comets, or comets that are a very short period. They don't go too far away from the sun. They have very short periods, so they'll just stay in this uh, kind of region of our solar system. But there's just a whole lot of stuff in our Kuiper Belt region, so I want to put away that for now because it's kind of slowing down my program. There we go. And now, folks, I'm going to be adding on screen some of the different spacecrafts we sent out in the 1970s to explore our solar system so we can learn more about it. So we're about to see the trajectories of, there we go, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a nice quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. We can see that nice interaction on the bottom right hand of the screen. And thanks to that quick flyby, we were able to get some amazing high-definition images of our dwarf planet. Now, just to let you know, folks, all these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape our sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not traveled as far as light travels in a single day. Now, in order for light to get all the way to the orbit of Pluto, it's going to take light about five hours at the speed of light just to get all the way out here to the orbit of Pluto. So eight and a half minutes to Earth and five hours to Pluto. But let's leave our planetary system behind because now we're going to be heading out into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us over four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. And let me just get a quick glance, see of all of our nearest star systems. All right, so if my calculations are correct, I believe the Alpha Centauri system is going to be the one on the right-hand side screen. So our solar system is right in the middle. Alpha Centauri is going to be on the right side screen right over there closest to us. And uh, again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us. That's pretty far away, but how far away is that in terms of human time? Well, let's say if we were getting a rocket ship of today and left our Earth and head over to the next star system, it's going to take our rocket trip about 8,500 years to cross that distance just to get to over to the next star system. Whew, that is a very, very long road trip. But let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now, folks, we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. And here we are. So again, we are now inside the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. Now, this first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, and radar signal, and then later, the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. Now, humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And folks, right now I'm going to be adding some markers onto our screen. These markers represent some of the many thousands of, dis uh, thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 22 years, which has at least one or more planet orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found roughly approaching to 5,000 exoplanets in our nearby vicinity. That 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years continue because we have space telescopes where their whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. So every night they're scanning the night sky trying to find as many exoplanets. In fact, you can see on the bottom right hand of our screen, uh, when we point our telescopes in one direction, we found a whole heap of exoplanets just in that one direction right down there. So let me angle it just a little bit better. There it is on that bottom right side screen of that radio sphere. Now, to say if any of them are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, we can't answer that question quite yet, but we do have new ge generations of astronomical instruments that are devoted for that search, so we're going to wait a few more years before we can answer that question. But the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light-year limit, or 
90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in a star system on the far left of our radio sphere. Let's say this one right over here. We find an alien civilization across the way. Let's say this one over here on the right side. We'll shoot them a text message, hi, and it takes about 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back another 60 years to get that message back. So that is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew. And I can barely wait for a text message from my friend. Hee hee hee. But of course, folks, planetary systems beyond our radiosphere have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radiosphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. And for now, folks, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers because there's quite a few of them up there. But I want to leave our radiosphere up on screen. As huge as humanity's influence is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. So let's zoom on out and get a better look at our own galaxy. Alrighty, can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding. So folks, we are now looking down on our Milky Way galaxy. This is the galaxy we live in, and our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross our galaxy from one side all the way to the other, it's going to take about 130,000 years at the speed of light. Woo, that's really big. But not only that, our Milky Way is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy alone. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I do want to stress the shape of it. When we look at it from a sideways perspective, you'll notice that we live in a flat spiral disk. So when astronomers want to learn about the universe, it's so much more convenient for them to look or point their telescopes and equipment galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of our Milky Way, which has planets, stars, gas, debris, black holes, things that obscure their view of the universe. So keep that in mind. That's going to come, come important later on in the show. We like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south. But the Milky Way galaxy is only one of many galaxies that comprise the known universe, folks. So now in this giant leap, every single point of light that you're now going to see is not a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps even trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small, and also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door, and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue um, zooming out, folks, you're now going to notice that Galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to avoid each other with very few galaxies or voids where there's no galaxies at all. We can see a nice galaxy cluster right over here. We can see another galaxy cluster on the top right. We can see some voids on the very top left where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies at all. You can kind of think of galaxies as people. They like to hang out together in groups, or they like to avoid each other. But folks, we've zoomed so far back out now that we're now looking at a picture that represents the 30,000 closest galaxies to us in space, over 300 million light years across. We've got to give thanks to an amazing uh, astronomer by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii to compile this amazing representation with the work of dozens of other astronomers working beside uh, him over decades of time. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tolley. I love flying through this galactic map. Very fun. But now, folks, we have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So now we're about to see the large-scale structure of the universe. And remember, every single point of light that you're seeing is not a star. That's an individual galaxy, like the Milky Way. Whoa. And just to let you know, the large-scale structure of the universe is not shaped like a bow tie or a butterfly. Remember when I mentioned that we live in a flat spiral disk of the Milky Way? Uh, so we point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south. So if we were to line up our Milky Way galaxy, it would line up just like so uh, where, these, uh, where there's no galaxies. 
but astronomers still wanted to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane of the Milky Way. So we have this nice little purple survey of galaxies right in the middle. You'll notice that they'll, they'll, they find galaxies, but not as many or as far. Pretty much we have to wait for our technology to improve before we can fill in all these dark gaps that haven't been mapped out yet. Pretty much you can think of all this galaxy stuff on top and bottom, but in every direction that you look. So it's just a matter of time before we fill in our map even more. But folks, it looks like we're running dangerously out of time. There's just not enough time to talk about the universe in simply 30 minutes. Whew. But we must press on because we still have a little bit of a ways to go to get to the very edge of the known universe. And now, folks, we're going to be coming across these objects uh, at the very edge of the large-scale structure of the universe, these orange dots called the quasars. So you'll see them at the very bottom or at the very top. These are the quasars. And quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. And these blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we are about to see the very edge of the known universe. Alrighty, folks, we are now at the very edge of the known universe, and what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. Now, all evidence indicates that the universe we live in is about 13.8 billion years old, and this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And what we're looking at is not a typical photo either. Instead, what we're looking at is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But eventually, they gave rise to the large-scale structure of the universe, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, that earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us, so we only have one direction left to go. That's going to be back home, back to planet Earth. And before we make our return trip back to planet Earth, I've got to ask you all to prepare yourself because this could possibly be the worst free-falling dream ever. Hee <laughs> hee. But let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies. And let's make our return trip back to planet Earth, folks. So we are crossing an expanse of over 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of years apart. Now, we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, folks, I want you to remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But it looks like we just made our way back into our radio sphere. We're heading back to our star system. And it looks like we're passing those spacecrafts we sent down in the 1970s to explore our solar system, passing the Kuiper Belt, passing the main asteroid belt. And we're making our way to the third rock from the sun, our home world, the only place we humans have ever lived. And all the people that we know and love all reside on this one planet. And now we're passing the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, folks, this is going to be the end of our Tour of the Universe show. And I want to thank you all for stopping by and watching it with me this afternoon. I hope you did enjoy it. But for now, folks, that's all for today. And uh, thank you again. Take care.